Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our series studying uh, the book of Job, and we're going to start with chapter 30 tonight. If you have not seen the previous studies uh, on Job, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, but uh, before we get started, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi, introduce himself to everybody. Hello, it's me again, the whole mo. That's D E H A L L M O. Uh, just type that in, and uh, you should be able to figure something out. Okay, back to you. Yeah. Okay, brother. Uh, well, let me let's take just a minute here, anyway, to uh, acknowledge a couple of things. You know, yesterday was Thanksgiving Day here in the United States. And I think that Brother Bill told me that in England they have they also have a Thanksgiving celebration too, uh, and maybe they do at other places in the world. But at least in America, uh, there's a Thursday every November where we celebrate Thanksgiving. And I'm happy that uh, our government saw fit to designate one day annually for everybody to be thankful. And I, I think the intention, of course, is to give thanks to God. Um, even though some people, they've totally taken God out of the holiday. <laughs> but uh, the point is to thank God. And uh, I, I wish, I pray that actually that uh, people would thank God every day. I, to me, I'm glad we've got at least one day set aside for it. But I really wish that uh, every day people would be thankful and count their blessings every day. Uh, but I had a great Thanksgiving um, dinner and party last night with friends and family. So it was a great day for me. I'm, I'm very, very happy today. And uh, I think that uh, what I saw happening on the news today with uh, a murderer, a crazy murderer, is uh, shooting a bunch of people in Colorado. And uh, I hope everybody will pray for the, the victims and their families. Uh, Brother Eric, anything before we get started into Job? uh is my video okay all of a sudden oh uh, yeah uh well yes brother luke i uh would like to extend my deep heart deepest heartfelt sympathies uh to the victims of uh any and all violence uh that has occurred in the last couple of days uh and uh as far as uh celebrating thanksgiving uh i believe this country was founded on the gospel of jesus christ and uh thanksgiving celebrates that event and uh i would like to have the whole world celebrate thanksgiving okay back to you yes well i, I i've talked to some people over the years and um, when they're unhappy, they're having, going through some difficult time, maybe like Job, but not to such not as bad as Job's, but they're they're depressed. And one of the things I've always tried to get them to do is is make a list, uh, make a list of all the blessings, everything in your life that you can be thankful for, and and uh, make it as long and complete as you can, and acknowledge everything, and 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 then if, once you do that. It puts things in perspective. So whatever problem we have, we have one problem, even though it may be bad, we add up all the blessings and the scale tilts enormously. It's just we're all so blessed. And uh, so that kind of perspective can help us to, to stay uh, happy and joyful. All right, brother, let's get on with uh, Job chapter 30. I'm going to read it in the KJV first, and then we'll go through it more slowly in the Amplified. I'll read the whole chapter here in the KJV straight through. So listen, and, and then I'll ask for your feedback on the whole thing. It says, um, uh, but now they, this is Job still speaking, but now they that are younger than I 
have met me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age was perished. For want and famine, they were solitary, fleeing into the wilderness in former time, desolate and waste. Who cut up the who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat? They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief, to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in caves of the earth, and in the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed, under the nettles they were gathered together. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. And now am I their song, yea, I am their byword. They abhor me, they flee far from me, and spare not to spit in my face, because he hath loosed my cord and afflicted me. They have also let loose the bridle before me. Upon my right hand rise the youth. They push away my feet, and they raise up against me the ways of their destruction. They mar my path. They set forward my calamity. They have no helper. They came upon me as a, as a wide breaking in of waters. In the desolation, they rolled themselves upon me. Tears are turned upon me. They pursue my soul as the wind, and my welfare passeth away as a cloud, and my soul is poured out upon me. The days of affliction have taken hold of me. My bones are pierced in me in the night season, and my sinews take no rest. By the great force of my disease is my garment changed. It bindeth me about as the collar of my coat. He hath cast me into the mire, and I am become like dust and ashes. I cry unto thee, and thou dost not hear me. I stand up, and thou regardest me not. Thou art become cruel to me. With thy strong hand thou opposest thyself against me. Thou liftest me up to the wind, thou causest me to ride upon it, and dissolvest my substance. For I know that thou wilt bring me to death, and to the house appointed for all living. Howbeit he will not stretch out his hand to the grave, though they cry in his destruction. Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? When I looked for good, then evil came unto me. And when I waited for light, there came darkness. My bowels boiled and rested not. The days of affliction prevented me. I went mourning without the sun. I stood up and I cried in the congregation, I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. My skin is black upon me and my bones are burned with heat. My harp also is turned to mourning and my organ into the voice of them that weep. That's a, that's a sad song, very sad song he's singing. Brother, your, your impression of the whole chapter. Uh, my impression uh, would be one word, and uh, that would be humiliation. He's expressing... Uh, deep-seated humiliation uh, in this whole ordeal that he is suffering. Back to you. Yeah, it, it, it seems that he is uh, continuing on with what he said in the previous chapter, 29, uh, lamenting this great fall because he had such status. Uh, we said in the last chapter that we, he appeared to be, really, it sounded like he was a king because even princes answered to him. And, and uh, it just seemed like he was the, the richest, most powerful, most authoritative. Uh, 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 and everybody almost worshiped him and respect him so much. Everybody wanted his counsel. And then he fell because of 
uh, him losing his wealth and his family and his health. And now he's in total despair and he is humiliated. Uh, this fall is just, it's just crushing him. I mean, not only financially and, and, and uh, physically, but just but spiritually and, and emotionally, he's just crushed from all this and uh, certainly is heartbroken over it. Could you blame him? Uh, no, not at all. But uh, I don't think any of us could ever possibly fathom uh, the painfulness of it. Okay, back to you. Yeah, one of the things that we gain from studying Job is perspective on our lives because every person if you if you live long enough you're going to suffer you're going to have some calamity some uh, time you'll fall into despair over something now if you are if you have a very short life and you're just a little child or something and you don't live long enough to uh, to experience those things then then that's the only way to avoid it because if you live long enough, eventually your world seems going to be fall apart. It's, I think it's going to happen to everybody, even the richest people like Job. But in comparison, Job's case is so extreme, so severe, that it gives us an opportunity to measure us, measure our hard times against his. And a few people could compete <laughs> with, with the troubles of Job. I mean, there are people that can. I mean, some people's their lives are horribly, a lot of suffering in every way too. But, but for most people, our sufferings do not measure up to Job's. Okay, before I go on and read it slowly in the Amplified, any anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, I would like to say Job is one of my most inspirational characters of the Old Testament. Even God mentions and singles out. Noah, Daniel, and Job uh, in scriptures as uh, three uh, very faithful and uh, highly uh, respected uh, to God himself. Okay, back to you. Well, uh, I don't know where they've list, but those three are listed. Are they listed together? But uh, I, I could understand how they could be in a, a kind of a different class of, of – of, uh, Bible characters. They certainly are so admirable. Noah, of course, Noah, he, he did get drunk, you know, and so that's his, and the, the accusation of him is he got ended up getting drunk. Well, it doesn't sound like a horrible thing to do, but, but everybody has some kind of, um, uh, there's, it's possible to criticize pretty much everybody except for Enoch, nothing to, bad to say about Enoch. I don't think there's anything bad to say about the the uh, the apostle John. Um, he's the only one that didn't leave Jesus. He was with him at the cross. Uh, but there's there's a few characters. But da look at David. You know he he as great as he was. They said he's a man of of, of God's own heart. God, he's such a, an inspiration and example to us. And yes, we know that he was a a murderer and adulterer. Moses was guilty of murder paul the apostle paul was a murderer and 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 put laid siege to the church so uh pretty much all the main characters of the bible uh there's a lot of fault we can find in them uh you know abraham and isaac and jacob were all liars uh so uh, uh when you when you mention job though I don't see any fault in Job. He, at no point does he ever reject God and hate God. And even though he is thinking God's responsible for it, he doesn't understand why. But even in this chapter, it sounds like he's thinking that God is doing this. And we, we know that God is not doing this to him, right? That's right, Brother Luke. Uh, I did locate that verse, Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men... Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. Uh, he was talking about uh, 
judgment against some city there. Uh, and uh, okay, back to you. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so let's go now slowly. I'm um, reading it in the Amplified because the Amplified is like a commentary of, on each verse. It says, but now those younger than I mock and laugh at me, whose fathers I refuse to put with the sheepdogs of my flock. Well, we know that uh, in the previous chapter, it, 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 he's also making the same kind of uh, uh, a complaint that he used to be so respected, but nobody respects him anymore. Even the young people, they used to step aside and, you know, give, give way for him and out of respect. And, and now that they isn't getting respect, even from the young people that, and the young people should automatically feel obligated to respect the elderly. And, and Job, of course, he's older than young people, but he's not an old man. Um, that's, that was discussed in, um, uh, I don't know, chapter probably three or four, I guess. I, I don't remember where it is, but it was interesting. It was a new fact that I discovered. And that's one thing I want to say earlier, too, is that I've read Job uh, numerous times over the years, but I've never studied Job as we are doing here. I've read it, but I've never stopped to really study it and analyze it completely as we are, are now. And I, I'm getting a lot more out of it because of this careful study. And I'm, I'm just really admiring Job even more. But Tell me what you're, you're mean, this means here. It says, but now those younger than I mock and laugh at me, whose fathers I refuse to put with the sheepdogs of my flock. What's that mean? Well, that uh, the tone of that verse and uh, all the subsequent verses is what led me to uh, conclude that this whole chapter uh, is focused on his humiliation. And uh, it's very humiliating uh, for uh, men that he had no respect enough for even to let him them uh, take care of his dogs. Their kids are uh, making a mockery of Job now. Uh, back to you. Uh, well. You know, I, I've, I mentioned this numerous times that uh, in the KJV, it does not have a title for a chapter, and it doesn't have subtitles uh, throughout the chapter. Um, but the the Amplified Translation, the the publishers or translators or scholars, whoever uh, wrote it, they they put in titles and subtitles. It's interesting because the the, the the title that they gave this chapter is Job's present state is humiliating. So they certainly are in agreement with your point that you've, you've made here is that uh, this is the humiliation of Job. Okay, let me oh. read. Hey, let's uh, score one for my side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you get, uh, it wouldn't be the first time you get another gold star on your, on your card there. Um, Okay, verse 2 says, Indeed, how could the strength of their hands profit me? Vigor had perished from them. I think he, is he still talking about the, the young people that are mocking him, or is he talking about their fathers who he refused to, eat, to, put, with, uh, to put with the sheepdogs of my flock? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think he's still talking. I'm not quite sure what he's saying, though. Uh, read it again in the Amplified. Indeed, how could the strength of their hands profit me? Vigor had perished from them. Okay, I still don't quite understand what their, the meaning of that is. Yeah, well, the, the KJV says, Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age was perished? I, I, yeah, I just, I don't understand e really either one, the KJV or the Amplified on verse 2. And verse 3 says, They gaunt with want and famine. 
They gnaw the dry and barren ground by night in the gloom of waste and desolation. See, the, what I'm having a problem is, with, is the word they. In verse 2 and 3, um, it, it, they're referencing somebody. It says, indeed, how could the strength of their hands profit me? Vigor, vigor had perished from them. Then he says, they are gaunt with want and famine. But I'm not sure who they is. It's, it relates back to, I'm sure, the verse 1. But let me read verse 1 again in the KJV and then the Amplified. It says, but now they that are younger than I have met me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. Okay, so what Job is doing, he's going on to extol the baser qualities of those people, uh, and he does that up through verse 8, where he's extolling the baser qualities of these men uh, and their children who are the least, uh, the least, uh, respected uh, people uh, in his community. Uh, we all have uh, people groups that we uh, disdain and uh, we have people groups that we love uh, and we can compare it to them. Okay, back to you. Yeah, and, and if, he, if he's describing them in that way, it, it shows you how far he's fallen because these people have no reputation and, and, they, and, and they're, they're, they're not even like good enough to be hired to work in his with his sheep, you know, and, and yet they think they're better than him now. And, they, and, 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 and he's so humiliated because he was so elevated. And now even the lowest people think they're superior to him, I guess. Is that, was that what you're getting out of it? Yes, yes, Brother Luke, and he goes on to uh, uh, describe uh, a lot of their uh, weaknesses uh, in the next uh, half a dozen verses or so. All right, let me go on then. Okay, so verse 4 says, They pluck and eat salt wort mallows among the bushes. Uh, you know, in the KJV or the Amplified, I have no idea what that is, a salt wort mellows uh they eat and pl they pluck and eat salt worked oh let me see there's a note at the bottom a let me see what it says here a it says a plant of the salt marshes okay doesn't sound too appetizing doesn't sound like it's the kind of food that the successful people would eat probably the very poorest people would eat that and it says and their food is the root of the broom shrub <laughs> That's pretty low. If you have to eat your food is the from the broom shrub. Um, uh, and then verse five, they are driven from the community. They shout after them as a thief. They must dwell on the slopes of Wattis. That note on that in Wattis is, uh, let me see, it says it's a, uh, gullies or valleys made by torrents of water okay uh, they must dwell on the slopes of wadis and in holes in the ground and in rocks this is the lowest of the low and then but but job is below them now among the bushes they cry out like wild animals beneath the prickly scrub they gather and huddle together they are the sons of worthless and nameless fools. They have been driven out of the land, and now I have become the subject of their taunting. Yes, I am a byword and a laughing stock to them. Wow. Man. I mean, it, it's, it's bad enough that your entire family is killed and all of your livestock and property is destroyed. And then you get boils from the soles of your feet to the top of your head and you're in horrible health, you're wishing you're dead, you're suffering so much pain. 
And now on top of that, the people that everybody disdain, they're laughing at Job. And he was the most esteemed of person in the land. And now they laugh at him and mock him. What a fall, brother. Yes, brother Luke. And still he is able to so eloquently and so thoroughly describe his dire situation to us. That's got to be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, when we think about humiliation, I had a brother get get mad at me uh, like six months ago, and he um, we we've since kind of talked it out and stuff. But he thought that I had humiliated him, and all I did was really just disagree with it. I mean, like like if you and I we have a, we're discussing this, and you have a conclusion about the verse, and I say I disagree, brother. I think this is the meaning. It's it's not to, intended to humiliate you. You're just saying no. This is how I see it. It's differently than you do, but he was offended by it and 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 felt humiliated, and I, I really regret that happening. But uh, uh, I you know I think that was his issue. He shouldn't have responded that way because I wasn't I didn't speak to him in a condescending way. Uh, I, I didn't belittle him in any way, and yet that's how he reacted. Um, I'm wondering about humiliation uh, in my life. I don't think many, I don't think of any example of, of great humiliation I've suffered. Uh, I've been embarrassed sometimes and sometimes I probably felt like, oh, I, 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 uh, I didn't do as, as, as well as I should have. And, you know, but, but utter humiliation, I can't recall having utter humiliation. I don't, have you ever experienced it? Uh, absolutely, Brother Luke. I was humiliated the day I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't you. It was your mom and dad that was humiliated. <laughs> okay, see? that's going too far. <laughs> <laughs> now, you see, I tried to be funny. And now you could take it as a joke or you could be like, feel like, oh, look, he's insulted me. But uh, I just thought I'd go along with your humor. And, but my problem is in my life, usually if I try to be funny, I'm an utter failure at humor. I just, people don't understand my feeble attempts at humor. I understand your feeble attempts at humor and I find them very humil hilarious. <laughs> Okay, good. All right, let's go on then. Um, verse 10, they hate me. They stand aloof from me and do not refrain from spitting in my face. For God has loosed his bowstring attacking me and he has afflicted and humbled me. They have cast off the bridle of restraint before me. Well, I think we need to stop here in verse 11 when he says, for God is afflicting him and humbling him. Uh, what is your reaction to Job's statement that he, God is uh, humbling him? Uh, the KJV doesn't mention that it was God. Okay, let me look at that in the KJV and see how it expresses it. Verse 11 says, Because he hath loosed my cord and afflicted me, they have also let loose the bridle before me. You know, uh, brother, when, when, when I read the entire chapter straight through in the KJV initially, and I read that portion, uh, I was trying to decide uh, who he is. And I, I, I believed that it was God, but I was unsure. I was wanted to, I wanted to, as we went through it more slowly, try to figure out if that, is that God? He's, is, he, is he blaming God again now? Uh, and I, I do think that uh, we should consider it to be God when it says he there in the KJV and the Amplified, it, it says God. I think they are correct. Is there any reason for us to think he's not referring to God? 
uh, it's very possible that that first half of that verse, he is uh, referring to God. Uh, I don't know if that can be confirmed or not. Uh, but in the past, he has... Uh, uh, he has uh, mentioned pretty similar statements uh, to God in that respect. So, okay, back to you. Yeah, I get the feeling watching you struggle with with that last statement you made there that you you might have wanted to say that he was had previously blamed God. I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but I was thinking that that he. He has said it already in previous chapters. He was blaming God, saying God is responsible for this. God is doing this to me. I don't know why. I'm righteous. And then his friends criticize him and blame him. And he says, well, okay, God's doing it to me. And maybe, I, maybe I've done something. And, but then he goes back and forth, back and forth, saying, I don't deserve it. And then sometimes say, well, maybe I deserve it. But all the while, he does believe that God is afflicting him. And the problem is, as we've said this probably 20 times already in all these chapters, we keep ha we ha must continue to bring this up because a lot of people weren't with us in chapter one and two. And they don't know really that, that how the whole thing was uh, uh, began. And you can really come to some wrong conclusions. God is not afflicting Job. God is not punishing Job or chastising him for his sinfulness and wickedness as his so-called friends are claiming. Uh, Satan is afflicting Job and God is permitting it, but God doesn't desire that these things happen to Job. He's allowing it, but uh, because he told Satan, Satan said, I've traveled all over the world and there's not one righteous person, not, not one person really loves you. And he said, well, have you considered Job? You know, I, I think if you consider Job, you'll see you're wrong. And uh, Satan says, well, yeah, Job seems to love you, and, but, but you know, if you let me test him and I'll, I'll show you, he doesn't really love you. Uh, let me take away all the blessings you've given him and he will curse you. And so that's the, that's the preface. That's the, the, the foundation for this whole story. But but Job wasn't there watching the, the, the meeting between Satan and God. Uh, his friends, that Job's so-called friends that keep on uh, criticizing him and blaming him, uh, they don't know what's going on either. They, they're not privy to that meeting between Satan and God. So they're all, they all are, are in the dark. They don't know what's going on. And therefore, they're all jumping to the wrong conclusions. But here again, Job is lamenting how humiliated it is. And he says in verse 11 that God is humbling him. And he certainly is being humbled, but it's not because God decided he wants to humble him. He's just allowing it. Now, some people could say, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between God deciding he's going to afflict Job and versus God not afflicting Job, but permitting Satan to do it? Can you see a distinction there? Uh, yes, and we've discussed this uh, in the past, and I'm sure uh, this concern has uh, been uh, raised by many folks, and we're very anxious to know uh, from you uh, what it is. I think part of it, of course, is uh, uh, based upon God's foreknowledge. I mean, God, God already knows before Satan comes to him, he's going to come to him. God already knows that, that about this arrangement with Satan. He already knows what Job's going to go through, and he knows how Job will profit in the end. After all this ordeal, he will profit. He will have even more. And, and he knows how Job will end up coming out of this smelling like a rose. And uh, so in that way, uh, even though Job is going to suffer, uh, not only does Job end up being blessed, but Satan gets uh, proven wrong. 
and and we brother eric brother luke and anybody watching now we all get to benefit from learning about this experience of job we get perspective in our lives we get to say like uh when we complain that we don't have any shoes and then we meet someone who has no feet we get perspective when we when we are going through difficult times and we read about job we get perspective and now when, we, when life is difficult we could turn our back on god we can get angry with god we could lose our faith there's all kinds of ways we can react but job is an inspiration because even though he thought job was god was punishing him somehow um he still loved god and he still believed in god he didn't reject him he wouldn't curse him he, he he never lost his faith so that's an inspiration and an example to all of us so was it worth it for job to go through all that suffering and he came out better in the end and we came out better in the end because of learning from this this uh these events I don't want to call it these this story because a lot of times people think that some of these things in the Bible are just stories so you can learn a lesson. But this is an event. This is a historical event. This is a real person, real events that happened. And that's one of the things I was saying last night when I got into my debate with some friends and that the, the Bible, I, I take the Bible as history. It, it You know, Jonah was really in the whale. Noah really did build an ark. Animals really did go in the ark. There really was a flood. And even the creation account in the garden with Adam and Eve, it's history. It's not just some kind of a parable or, or beautiful story so we can learn some spiritual lesson. So, and that's the truth with Job too, but some people think Job is just a story for you to learn, learn a lesson. Okay, before I go on, any reaction to all that? Uh... I was wondering, Brother Luke, uh, is God obligated to prove his work to others? It seems to be his M.O. He's always out uh, proving his work to Satan, or what do you think? I don't think this was really for Satan at all. Um, I think it's for us. Uh, first of all, I have greatly benefited from um, reading the book of Job. And as we study it, and as I said, I'm getting a lot more out of it from this study of Job. And anybody who takes the time to read it and study it, it their life is better. They'll be blessed because of it. So it, it, it's for us. It's for our benefit. It wasn't for Satan's benefit. He doesn't have to prove anything to Satan. That's how I see it. What do you think? Uh, I agree with you on the point that Job has been very beneficial in my life as well some of my hardest times in my life thanks to the book of job i could stand on the words of job who said even if god kills me i'm still gonna trust him okay back to you brother luke yeah i tell you what though um uh, one of the brothers that we love here on YouTube uh, told me that uh, I've invited him to participate. And he first he said to me that uh, he didn't think he was qualified uh, uh, to to participate. And I said, "Are you? First of all, you're qualified. You have a lot of knowledge. But but on, on the other hand, even if a person didn't have a lot of knowledge." that it's just part of we're having a conversation we, we you know if you if you don't understand it maybe you'll learn by by being part of the conversation but this brother is is probably in my opinion the greatest that i've ever met that i've ever encountered in apologetics uh arguing against atheism and darwinism he's the best i've ever seen and yet he felt that he was not qualified to talk about Job and, 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 and the Gospel of John and Proverbs and these other things. Uh, but I, uh, I felt probably years ago that I would never be taking on these things. I felt a little insecure about it, but I, re I came to the conclusion that uh, 
I, I, I know that I'm not omniscient. I don't know everything. I, I, I look at all the verses that we've discussed here tonight, and I say, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure about this. What do you think? I, I, I don't know what every verse means. And many times, uh, I don't know at all. And, and other times, I, I think I know, but I'm not positive. I'm not really so sure. And so once I accepted that, with humility, I could go forward and say, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna go into Job. Even though I may not be able to explain it and give an answer every time, that's okay. I don't have to be perfect. I'm not infallible. So uh, because of that attitude, now we're studying Job, we're studying Proverbs, we're studying the Gospel of John and early church history, things that I wouldn't have done in the past because I was a little insecure about uh, entering that kind of uh, arena. In the past, over the many years, what I did was I talked about a subject, primarily salvation. I talk about, and then over years, I decided to take on subjects I didn't really understand, or wasn't sure about, but I thought, this isn't study, this is a topic that needs to be studied and needs to be discussed. So even though I didn't know it, I was willing to go into it and try to learn as I went along. And I'm happy that I developed that attitude. I think it's a healthy attitude. And I, I hope that more people will develop that attitude and, and even join us. If, if You don't have to be like feel like you've got all the answers to participate in the conversation, do you? Uh, absolutely not, Brother Luke. Uh, we only require that uh, your gospel message uh, rings true. And uh, if you agree to the three core doctrines, uh, then uh, you're solid. And we want you in here. And we invite you to come in here now, right now. Okay, back to you. All right, brother. We'll move on now. Um, in verse 12, it says, On my right, the, the rabble brood rises. They push my feet away. And they build up their ways of destruction against me like an advancing army. They break up and clutter my path, upsetting my plans. They profit from my destruction. No one restrains them. As through a wide breach they come, amid the crash of falling walls, they roll on over me. So it's just um, everything. And, and I, I think one of the hardest things for Job out of this whole thing, man, this is just my opinion, my reaction to it. I, I, I can't really cite verses to say I'm absolutely right on this. But, you know, look at all the things he suffered. But maybe one of the hardest things is his so-called friends coming and condemning him. And, and saying he's wicked, and uh, he's defend he's chapter after chapter they're arguing back and forth, and he's defending, saying I'm not wicked, I've given to the poor and I've helped people and I've done all these things, and I, you know I'm, you're accusing me of things that falsely accusing me, and and uh, so I don't know I, I it, it's another kind of of. Um, uh, suffering that a person go through is is feeling that your friends are turning against you and I think that's probably maybe just as hard as dealing with the bad the, the health problems what do you think um, in light of the chapter that we're reading now uh, I would say that the most uh, painful part of the ordeal was the humiliation he suffered at the hands of the uh, the most uh, basest people group in his community, uh, which we were discussing right now, uh, what happened there. All right. It goes on in uh, verse 15. Terrors are turned upon me. They chase away my honor and reputation like the wind, and my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. 
And now my soul is poured out within me. The days of affliction have seized me. My bones are pierced with aching in the night season and the pains that gnaw me take no rest. By the great force of my disease, my garment, my skin is disfigured and blemished. It binds about me, choking me like the collar of my coat. So here he's mentioned the, the humiliation. And then he goes on and talks about the bad health and how he's suffering physically and also how he has uh, his prosperity has passed away. So he's he's running off a list of all the things that he, um, he suffered. And then verse 19, he says, it's God, God that's doing it. He says in verse 19, God has cast me into the mire, a swamp land of crisis, and I have become worthless like dust and ashes. I cry to you for help, Lord, but you do not answer me. I stand up, but you only gaze indifferently at me. You have become harsh and cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you keep me alive only to persecute me. You lift me up on the wind and cause me to ride upon it, and you toss me about in the tempest and dissolve me in the storm. For I know that you will bring me to death and to the house of meeting appointed for all the living. Uh, so some people, they could think that Job is, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, somehow this is not admirable. Uh, Job is such an example to us, and yet he's saying, God, you're doing this to me. And you're silent. I can't get you to listen to me. You turned your back on me. And, 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 and he said in previous chapters, and I haven't done anything to deserve this. So on one hand, people can say, well, that's not very admirable for Job. He's, he's, he is, he's blaming God. And, you know, the reader knows that God's not to blame, but Job is blaming God. But there's a great distinction between blaming God and saying, God, you're doing this to me. And, and uh, as, uh, as his wife and Satan said, he'll curse you. He, he, he will hate you. Uh, no, he doesn't curse God. He doesn't hate God. He still has faith. He's not saying you don't exist. He hasn't, he has denounced his even belief in God. He knows God exists. So I don't know. I, I, a person could read it and, and get the impression that the Job is, is being weak and, and not uh, virtuous in, in the sense that he's saying God's doing these things to him. All these horrible things is because God's doing it to him. And we know that he's wrong, but even if, even, even if he was right, uh, the fact that he's saying God's doing it to him, does that take away from God, from Job's character, in your opinion? Uh, definitely not. In my opinion, I have the same relationship with God, the Father, that Job had. Because Jesus said, cast all your cares upon me. Because... Well, where does that say that? It says, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. And uh, I do that. I tell it to him like it is. And it's not always nice, but it's the way I feel. Uh, and uh, those are my cares that I cast upon him. And that's what Job was doing. Uh, later on, uh, God does rebuke Job. I not sure what for we'll find out okay back to you yeah uh well um so that there are people that that think that um people lose their salvation 
if they reach a point where they've lost their faith. And, and of course, we know that's not true. Once a person believes in Jesus and gets born again, just as Nicodemus says, how can a man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, no, that's not, that's not possible. What I'm talking about is being born from above spiritually. So it's just as it's impossible to be born again physically. We can't go back into our mother's womb and have a second birth from the womb. Well, we cannot also undo the spiritual birth. It can't, it can't be undone. Once you're born again as a child of God, it can, it's irrevocable, it's irreversible. Uh, so some people, even if they lose their faith, the Bible says, when we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. My point is, I was asked by some guys when I was free preaching one day, they, it turns out they happened also to be evangelists, uh, but they, they asked me, Say, so, okay, so you're saying that when a person gets saved, uh, that's it. They, they're saved and it's it's done. But what, what happens if I commit a big sin here in Las Vegas on this vacation? And I said, well, yeah, that would be a shameful thing to do because when you commit sins, you know, you'll have consequences. Let's say you, you get, come to Las Vegas and you get drunk really bad and then you meet a prostitute and, and then you have a relationship with her. Or and, and then you go home and you give your wife a sexually transmitted disease and she leaves you and you get divorced and you lose your children. You see the consequences that can come from, from sin? There are consequences. But in spite of all that, you're going to go to heaven even though you, you sinned after you got born again. The, we, one consequence of our sin as a Christian is we don't, is not losing salvation. That's not a consequence to worry about. Uh, but then he asked me, he says, okay, what if, what if I no longer believe? Let's say that I, I, I lose my faith, like uh, my house burns down and my family's burned up, kind of like Job, you know, and he says, well, this, and then I get angry at God and hate God, or I don't even believe in God anymore. And I went like this. I said, when you get born again, you, you, uh, uh, Jesus grabs a hold of you. And, and he says, I've got you in the palm of my hand, and no one can pluck you out. And you, you've, you've reached and embraced Jesus. You put your faith in him. You've embraced him. He has a hold of you. And now your house burns down, and your children are killed, and your life is ruined, and you no longer believe in God. You lose your faith, or you say, I hate God. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And you try to leave the faith. Well, you can try to leave the faith. But he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He's got a hold of you. If he has to drag you to heaven, you're going to heaven. So my point is this blessed assurance that we have as Christians uh, that even if some like Job, it seems to me that he's, I don't know if we could say he's got to the point where he's angry, but he's blaming God. And, and what happens if people blame God like Job, Job's doing? God, what, you're doing this to me. And I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. And you're blaming God. Or let's say Job even gets angry at God. You know, have you, I don't know if you ever got angry with God. I, I think that people sometimes in their life, if they have a relationship with God where, where they are really communing and talking to God all the time, sometimes in despair, you might get angry with God and say, why? There was a brother here that used to do hangouts with me for years, and he's no longer with me. But but he uh, he told me one time he could not continue doing the broadcast because his wife left him. And it's been two years, and he's been praying every day for his wife to come back, and she hasn't come back, and so he can, can't continue doing the broadcast because he cannot put on a happy face and act like he's happy. And uh, so he got, and I think he reached a point where I, I don't think he lost his faith, but I think he got angry with God and so disappointed. Why aren't my prayers answered? Everybody's praying for me. I pray constantly. And yet she hasn't, my wife hasn't returned to me. So sometimes we do. We, it's, it's, 
It's not abnormal for a person to get angry with God sometimes if their prayers aren't answered. We're not perfect. Sometimes we'll get angry with God. And, I, and, and so it, we see Job here is like on the verge of being angry about, look, at God's doing this to me. God, is, you're, you're humbling me. You've taken everything away from me. But he still loves him. That's admirable. Some people that we know probably, they stop loving God. They reach the point where they just don't love God anymore because the prayers aren't answered, their life is a mess, and they're blaming God, and they lose their faith. But thankfully, Jesus has a hold of us, and he'll never let go of us. What's your reaction to that? Amen to that, Brother Luke. Uh, that was the whole point of the new covenant, uh, something that was unbreakable uh, if it could have been accomplished with any of our righteous works, then it would have. But none of our righteous works could do it. But the new covenant, the new testament is unbreakable. Thank you, Jesus. And I get mad at God all the time. I'm convinced that God just loves the making up part. Okay, back to you. Oh, yeah. that was good. <laughs> okay, I'll read the final verses here, and we'll try to end this. Uh, it says, um, verse 24, however, does not one falling in a heap of ruins stretch out his hand? Or in disaster, will he not therefore cry out for help? Did I not weep for those I did, I'm sorry, did I not weep for one whose life was hard and filled with trouble? Was not my heart grieved for the needy? When I expected good, then came evil to me. And when I waited for light, then came darkness. I am seething within and my heart is troubled and cannot rest. Days of affliction come to meet me. I go about mourning without comfort, my skin blackened by disease, not by the heat of the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry out for help. I am a brother to howling jackals and a companion to ostriches which scream dismally. My skin falls from me in blackened flakes and my bones are burned with fever. Therefore, my lyre, my harp, is used for the sound of mourning and my flute for the sound of the voices of those who weep. Whew. He's quite distraught. Brother, your, your comments on that and then the, the, and the entire chapter, and then we'll, we'll do our uh, invitation for salvation. Uh, Job is in a lot of pain here. Uh, he's being attacked uh, many different arenas. And uh, this seems to be the uh, apex of the whole book. Uh, the previous chapter, uh, he was reminiscing his glorious past. And this chapter, he's uh, extolling uh, the great humiliation that he's currently under. And... Uh, Okay, back to you. All right. Uh, we'll, we're going to end the study at the end of this chapter 30. We'll pick up with chapter 31 next time. Uh, but um, uh, every time we do a broadcast, uh, we want to make sure that we um, cover what is really most important. Uh, uh, you could... You could study all the books of the Bible and you, you could study all the theological questions that have ever been posed. You can become knowledgeable about everything theological. And yet, if you miss the one thing that is essential, the one thing that you cannot live without, it would be a horrible shame. And we, we want to make sure that we do not neglect that. So we're going to tell you the one thing that you need to know if you want to go to heaven. I mean, do you want to go to heaven after you die? Some people tell me no. If you don't want to go to heaven, that's fine. It's no skin off my teeth. You don't want to go. But if you're someone that says, yes, I believe there is life after death. I believe I, 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 and if, if there's a heaven, I want to go there. 
Well, do you know how to get there? Do you know what you've got to do so that you can get there? Um, I'm going to go over this more thoroughly, but uh, Brother Eric told me before we started the broadcast, he had prepared uh, a, a prayer or something that he wanted to uh, talk about regarding the salvation message. So let me give you a chance to do that now before I go on. Uh, thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, if you want to live forever in paradise with God, then say this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give me new life. I receive it. In Jesus name it's that simple if if you believe that promise Jesus will give you new life and then he'll want you to go and love one another okay back to you brother Luke yeah uh, everything in your prayer is beautiful and, and true uh, one of the things I really like is the fact that you you phrased it, thank you. Uh, in the prayer, you're, uh, you're saying, thank Jesus. Uh, well, what are you thanking him for? Well, be because he died for our sins and he gives us eternal life if we'll put our faith in him. It's a, it, The key that we want you to understand is that uh, salvation and eternal life in heaven is a free gift. God offers it to you. There's there's nothing you have to do to earn it. Uh, there's nothing you can do to purchase it. Uh, it, it. And because Jesus bought it for you already, the, the Bible says that he, he bought it with his, his own blood. It was You were bought with a price. Jesus' blood was shed on the cross. He suffered and died on the cross. That was the payment that was made so that he could buy the gift of eternal life for you. So that's what you really need to understand because the, the misconception in the world today, the misconception in the world throughout history is that the people that go to heaven are the good people. The people that go to hell are the bad people. In other words, they believe that heaven and hell is determined by personal merit. If you're good enough, you go to heaven. If you're not good enough, you have to go to hell. That's probably what you think if you have never studied biblical Christianity. That's probably what you think. All the religions in the world are really based on the merit system. Study all every religion and, and they think that, that uh, you, God stacks your good deeds on one side of a scale and your bad deeds on the other side of a scale. And, you know, more good or bad tilts the scale and that's where you go. But the Bible says that's a lie. In Romans 10, 3, it says that man is trying to get to heaven by establishing his own righteousness. But it says that's not God's way. That's man's way. That's the philosophy of man, thinking that they can go to heaven if they try hard enough to be a good person, join religions, become religious, follow religious rules. And if you do it well enough, God will say, hey, you're good enough. You can come to heaven. Uh, but the Bible says you can't get to heaven that way because the standard that you'd have to meet is perfection. You can't just be, you know, 51% good. You can't even be 90% good. You can't even be 99% good. You got to be 100% good. Only God is 100% good. That's why Jesus said no one's good but God. Uh, tr truly good means perfect. So uh, you have to understand that trying to get to heaven through your own efforts is futility. It's impossible. They, Jesus' apostles, when he, they were learning about this, they said, well, if this is the case then, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, that's right. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, you need to understand that trying to get through heaven through personal merit is impossible and give up on that. And now say, well, what, 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 what can save me? God. Jesus is God and Savior. 
he will give you to eternal life. And so as Brother Eric said, uh, Jesus is God and Savior. He died for our sins. He paid for all our sins. So you should be jumping for joy now if you believe that. The gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says that Christ died for our sins. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. Do you believe Jesus paid for your sins? If you believe that, then you should understand that sin is no longer an issue. You can go to heaven. Sin is not preventing you from going because Jesus paid for your sins. Uh, so what have you got to do? The Apostle Paul was asked, what must I do to be saved? And he said simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So Jesus paid for your sins. Believe that. Now, believe on Jesus. That means depend on him. Put your faith completely on him. Don't believe in yourself any longer. Put your faith in Jesus instead. And when you do that, he gives you the gift of eternal life as a free gift. That's what the Bible says. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You must understand that salvation and eternal life is a free gift. And thankfully, it's free to you because Jesus paid for it. Jesus bought it for you. Now, the one thing in the gospel that Brother Eric cited that is very important to understand is that it says he was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead. And why is this resurrection so important? See, if you study the Bible, you find that when Jesus was um, uh, ministering to the Jewish people, he made a lot of claims. He claimed he came down from heaven. He claimed he was God, the Alpha, the Omega. He says, I am the, the I am, the God Almighty. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, the Father and I are one. He claimed to be God. They wanted to stone him and kill him because of his claims. He claimed to be the Savior. He claimed to be the one and only way to go to heaven. You needed to come to him if you want to go to heaven. These are outrageous claims. And the Jewish people said, you need to show us a sign to prove your claims are true. He says, the sign I'll give you is if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. Now, they thought he was talking about the Jewish temple, but he was talking about the temple of his body. He's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection as a sign. Later, they and demanded a sign after he'd done dozens of the most miraculous things. He, he uh, made the lame walk. He made the blind see. He brought uh, 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 Nazareth, Lazarus back to life. And after all that, they still so give us a sign so we, to prove your claims are true. Jesus said, the sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. He would die, he would go into the tomb for three days, and then he'd be raised to life. He said, that's the sign he'll give us, and he did it. He was raised to life on the third day, and he walked among witnesses for 40 days, over 500 witnesses, they saw him, they talked with him, they touched him, they ate with him. And that resurrection, that bodily resurrection, bringing himself back to life, that's the way he proved his claims are true. He is God. He is the Savior. He does have power over life and death. And he says, I'll give you life everlasting in heaven if you believe in me instead of yourself. I hope you put your faith in Jesus now. Brother, any last words? Uh, thank you so much, Brother Luke. And this is uh, of supreme importance. Uh, it's the most important. If you're listening to this now, it's the most important thing you'll ever contemplate is your eternal destiny. And it's very urgent if God has, is tugging at your heartstrings to answer him and don't shrug him off. 
because Jesus is the only way, according to scriptures, he, God has provided his salvation very simply by believing on Jesus Christ. And even if you have tattoos on your body, you're eligible. That means everybody's eligible to receive this eternal life. Okay, back to you. All right, brother. Okay, uh, Brother Eric, thank you for participating tonight. Uh, viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.